So, did you always have a preference for dessert? I was a massive sweet tooth as a kid. I was the one that climbed up onto the kitchen bench to get the chocolate the cookie, cookie jar. jar with three Literally, chocolate cookies in it. And, um, you know, whenever I catch my kids now doing something similar, they go, but you did it when you were a kid. <laughs> really wish I'd never told you that. Anyway, so what we're going to do for dessert is um, a beautiful, uh, again, simple dessert that you can do in stages ahead of time. I'm big into being able to have things, when I've got the time and the space, make things. So make my aioli. Mate, you can even, you know what I did with the salmon recently was I smoked it all up and I did more than I needed and then I just put it into a freezer bag and into the freezer. So then I can pull that out on a work night, come home, defrost it and throw it through some veggies and it's done. I like doing things ahead of time that you can then... All right, now we need to change over a bit, don't we? Do we need we to do. some miso class? You can help class? me clean. Help me clean. What? Isn't that what a kitchen hand's Where's for? Where's the bin? Don't worry about the bin. Let's just get a new board. Okay. So, what we're going to do is a few different dishes, a few different little elements that we can put together as a um, dessert. So, I'm going to start off with some oranges. It's really important, I think, wherever you can, to use food that's in season. So, oranges are really coming into their own now, which is why clean? I wanted to use that. No, we can we'll use, put them, someone can clean them later. That's the best thing about doing cooking demos. So you get to cook, make all this mess, and then it magically disappears. I think I should say that too loudly. Okay. So, we're going to do uh, the oranges first. Um, but what I'm going to do is do a syrup. You're feeling a bit lonely and lost there, are you? It's fine. I'm, no, I'm just... learning, learning. Okay, okay. Learning. So, what we're going to do is just make a basic syrup with sugar and water, and it's the base to pretty much... Um, Almost any dessert. Actually, I'm also going to. Mm, so excuse me. You'd think after doing it since I was eight years old, I'd be a bit better at it, wouldn't you? Um, what we're going to do is we're going to make uh, a syrup for the oranges. And we're going to do boozy oranges. Boozy we're going to serve it with hazelnut praline, a dark chocolate crumb, and some mascarpone. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get a couple of things going straight away. I'm going to do the syrup and then a caramel for the praline. Praline. So, whoops. Sounds like something a ballerina would do. A <laughs> that might be a pirouette or a... Oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Don't know, just a thought. Where did my water jug go? There it is. So with a sugar syrup, it's really just equal quantities of sugar and water, um, and that makes what they call a heavy syrup. Um, as you can see, I just throw it in. But this is what I love about cooking is you can. And if you taste it and you think, oh, no, that needs a bit more sugar, throw a bit more in. Um, now, interestingly, to make a, a praline, it's actually just a caramel. And it starts off the same way with a sugar. But this time, just a little bit of water. Because any kind of caramel is actually just cooked sugar. Mm. Um, so that's what caramel is. You know when the chefs talk about caramelisation? Every food has naturally occurring sugars in it. And so um, when they cook and when they're put over high heat, those natural sugars caramelise. So you can caramelise meat, mm -hmm. you can caramelise onion, things you don't not necessarily think of have sugars in them. They do. Pretty much almost all food has some sugar in it. And when you cook it over high heat, it caramelises. To make a caramel, we simply just take the sugar and we cook it. You can use white sugar, you can use um, uh, caster sugar. I use caster sugar for demos because it's quicker. But if you need to use white sugar because that's all you've got in the cupboard, it's, it's exactly the same. It just takes a bit, excuse me, it just takes a bit longer. shouldn't eat and So that's talk. just on a high heat there. So I'm just, well, it's supposed to be on sort of medium heat, but medium I'm trying to go heat. quick. Medium okay. heat, um, okay. The other thing is with caramel, the big downside is, is that it can be like those science experiments that you had to do in year 10. You know when you have to create crystals and you put something in a beaker, I don't even know what it is, and a paddle pop stick with a string? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. And you come back the next week and there's a few little crystals. Are you a science teacher? Okay, good. Um, and then you come back. You come back the week after and there's heaps of crystals because crystals love, for some reason, to hang out with other crystals. I don't want that crystal science experiment in my caramel. So what I do is I have this little secret weapon. If I was to... I'm just going to turn that one off for a second. If I was to um, 
uh, just stir this, it would still turn into caramel. I just need to be careful to wipe down the edges with a pastry brush, with just plain water, to clean the pan. And I could actually do it. But when you've got something like glucose syrup and it's sitting in your pantry, if you can add a little glug of that, it saves you a whole lot of stress because glucose is actually a crystal inhibitor. So it's particularly good when you're trying to make caramel in front of a big crowd. Because <laughs> you can be then fairly sure you're not going to end up with a crystally mess. But you don't need it if you're careful. So I'm not always careful. Once it's all dissolved and clear, and you can tell when you take it off with the bubbles, then you can increase the heat and then you don't want to stir it. If I keep putting this back in and out, this as it dries can start to crystallise and end up creating that crystally mess. So you want to then just let it do its thing. And while it's doing its thing, we want to get a tray with some baking paper ready that we're going to then put our almonds onto because once it starts to colour, it actually starts to colour quite quickly. It will start to colour around the edges first because that's where the heat's coming up, so it's the hottest part of the pan. Um, but rather than putting anything in to stir, we'll just swirl it. And once it starts to colour, it starts to happen quickly, so you need to stand over it at that point. So I like to, at this point, get everything ready so I'm not going to miss it. Caramel sort of goes through different stages, so it can, you can have quite a blonde caramel. So, um, you know, if you're thinking inside like a violet crumble, so honeycomb really is just a caramel with then bicarb added and stirred through, and it puffs up, it has this lovely science experiment thing happening. Um, and if you've got a fairly blonde caramel and you add that, you'll end up with violet crumble. But if you let it go darker, you end up with crunchy. You know, that sort of darker caramel. I prefer a caramel that is on the darker side. To me, it's got more depth of flavour. Um, if you let it go a bit further, it starts to take on slight bitter tones, which can actually be good in a dish. Sometimes you want that little bitter element, a bit like the smoke. You can actually use it as another layer of flavour. If you keep going after that, it turns black, useless, probably have to throw the whole pot out as well. So you want to watch it. Um, the syrup is the same sort of thing, except we've used more water. And what we're actually going to do then, I better turn it back on. What we're then going to do is add, sorry, just think while I've got fire, because, you know, don't want to burn myself. Um, funny thing is, when I was on MasterChef, didn't burn myself, didn't cut myself badly at all. Was home about a month or six weeks, and my husband said, can you come and help with the school barbecue? Flipping sausages. Sure I can. Easy. Threw a pile of sausages on in my hurry. As yes, you do. Fat splash back, third degree burns on my finger. Oh. Like a couple of weeks after MasterChef. <laughs> Everyone's like, what? Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> what we're then going to do is flavour this syrup. So I've got a cinnamon quill and some star anise. And we will be adding some Grand Marnier. But I'm actually going to wait till that's taken on a little bit of the flavour before I add the Grand Marnier. And while that happens, we're going to uh, cut some oranges. Now, there's a couple of different ways you can deal with oranges. Um, I like to segment them. And it's largely because I think it harks back to my days as a fussy eater, mm -hmm. because I don't like the piss, in like the membrane in between. So you're going to peel so each individual one? I used to one. get really hassled at school in the staff room, because I'd sit there with my orange and I'd cut it into segments and eat it, and they'd go, are you serious? <laughs> yep, I just like it that way. Anyway, um, I'm going to show you how to do that, but I'm also going to show you a quicker, easier way. The one thing you really want to do when you're cutting an orange, though, is to get that white pith off the outside, because that actually has quite a nasty bitterness to it, and you don't want any of that in your um, dish, because it just flavours everything. I know some people can handle it, and go for it if you can, but I can't. You know, I couldn't even do the netball oranges on the side, I'd just suck it, wouldn't eat it. <laughs> no. Anyway, so once you cut away that pith, though, you start to see where the natural lines of the membrane are, and so... Then you can have lots of fun, if you've got lots of time, cutting in between each membrane, and you get, look at that. Oh, wow, that's just Beautiful. pure that flavour, is just pure juice, yumminess. orange with a bit of, you know, squishy texture. Do you want me to do that? Sure, go for it. I'm doing ooh, something. Ooh, ooh, that's a really good idea to go for it, because here's our caramel. So it started um, going brown on the edges quite quickly. Can you, oh, did you lose it? Okay, it's harder to tell in a black pot, so 
hopefully it won't be too blonde or too black. Okay, you can also tell by the smell. And once we've got them in there, we tip in our hazelnuts, which if you roast them and peel them, that's also a good thing. And we coat them in that caramel and tip them onto the tray. Yes, I've got crunchy. Oh, wow. That's what I wanted. And you have to work quite quickly then to sort of spread them out. It's that lovely caramel at this, smell. Yeah, it is. And at this point, you don't do what my sister does, has done twice. You'd think she'd learn the first time. She thought she'd taste it. <laughs> Why have a look? Now, excuse me. Um, this pot, though, when you are doing caramel, sometimes you think, yeah, but I don't really want that pot, although this is a non-stick. But what you can do is actually just pour a bit of water into the pot and it, um, and it will cook off all that sugar and you just tip it down the sink. So it's really quite easy to clean. So what we're then going to do is grab a heat-proof bowl, which I don't have, so... I might use a saucepan. See, MasterChef helps you come up with all different ideas of don't have it, just use something else. And what we're going to do is we're going to take these segments and pop them into our heat-proof bowl. But I'll show you with the next orange just a quicker way for those people who aren't quite so anal retentive as myself sometimes. Take the pith off. And then what you can do is you can also that you've got to get it all. You've got to get it all. I'm not the master chef. Yes. You'll learn, you'll learn. Oh, look at that. Who put him in charge? All right, once you've got it all though, whoop, then you can actually just slice down this way. You do get the little bit of membrane, but it's such a small, thin slice, and most people don't mind the membrane, they're not quite so fussy as me, so down that way. And then what we want to do is put that orange into the heat-proof bowl and then pour the syrup onto the top. That orange, now that it's been um, disassembled, for want of a better word, mm -hmm. it actually loses some of its structural integrity. So if we were to actually cook it and put the orange into the syrup, it would be too rapid and too hard for it to... Um, like it would disintegrate because the heat would be too strong. So this is what we call a secondary form of cooking. So we're adding the heat, but we're adding it so gently by doing it just in a heat-proof bowl. So I'm just going to quickly do this one. Mm. And then and we can... Do you have... follow the same process for desserts as you did with your main, in terms of having all those different Abs sweets? Sour... Absolutely. I used to, before MasterChef, whenever I saw salt in a dessert recipe, I used to think, oh, that's ridiculous, I'm not adding salt, it's sweet. And I realise now that I used to always make my desserts to be sweet on top of sweet on top of sweet on top of sweet, and it's just that cloying... Just not very nice. Whereas now I think all the time about sweet, sour, salt. Now, the salt, like the sweet in a savoury, we're not necessarily talking sugar in a savoury. And similarly, whoops, similarly in a, um, in a dessert, we're not necessarily talking salt, although these days with salted caramel and salted chocolate, you can go to town with your salt flakes. But what we are doing is we are still thinking about the natural... Um, characteristics of the food. So I'm going to be using mascarpone, and mascarpone is an Italian cream cheese, and it's a beautiful, rich, creamy thing. But it's not like, it's got a different density to normal cream, but it also has a slight savouriness to it. And for me, that is that salt element that brings the sweetness down. Then into the oranges, Grand Marnier. I like to do it after it's cooked, because that way you get more of that pow. You can, if, you, if you're cooking for either children or somebody who can't tolerate alcohol, if you put it into the syrup mix at the beginning, it will cook the alcohol out. Alcohol is sensitive to heat, and so it will cook out and you just get the flavour. And it's as simple as that. Now, ideally, I would do this the day before and just leave it in a bowl covered to macerate and just get, develop all those flavours. But equally, it will still work. And the thing with Grand Mounier is, you know, if you've had a bad day, you just add a bit more. <laughs> that was full when you came in. <laughs> you didn't see the swig, oh, no. Um, so we've got the hazelnut, we've got the oranges. The next thing I want to show you is a dark chocolate crumb. Oh, yeah. Now, I... Um, 
I'm choosing the chocolate here because we've got, we're choosing a dark chocolate because we've got that bitterness and again, just to try and counteract some of that sweetness because oranges are naturally sweet. The syrup we've put them in there are sweet. The Grand Marnier is sweet. Um, the, the sugar on here is sweet. Mm. So we need to just think of that savouriness. Oh, so the Grand Marnier also adds a slight acidity. So that's where the acidity, and depending on the ripeness of your oranges, there can also be a bit of acidity there too. So, um, but the chocolate adds that bitterness, but it's also going to add texture. So again, you know how we talked about contrast of texture? Mm. So we're going to have the, the squidginess of the um, oranges, we're going to have this liquid of the syrup, we're going to have the crunch of the praline, we're going to have the creaminess of the mascarpone, and now we're going to have this soft bite of the chocolate. Now, the one thing I must say about this chocolate crumb is it is most important that you use a really good quality chocolate. Compound chocolate is never going to cut it. If you don't like just sitting there eating it, don't use it here because all you're going to be doing is sitting there and eating it, basically. So I can just eat that? Yeah, I know. I tried one before. Have one. Thanks. That's the, part, that's the advantage of being up here, not down there. You'll get some in a minute. All we do for this is we put the chocolate into, it's good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We put, I can't even smell it. We put the chocolate into the uh, mixer and then we put in a bit of cocoa. Again, I like Dutch processed cocoa. Try and choose a high quality cocoa. This little trick is all, this little feature of the um, recipe is all about the chocolate. So you just want to use quality, quality, quality. And what we're going to do then is we're going to blitz it. If I can find the lid. Where did I put the lid? There it is. Oh, great. We're going to blitz it. sort of forms a crumb. So has your taste evolved? Absolutely. I think what's happened since starting MasterChef is I've just become more aware of what I'm eating. I take notice, and I think that's where most of my learning has happened, is actually just by, as I take a mouthful, I think, oh, there's the sweetness, there's the salt, there's the sour, there's the crunch, there's the... Cr oh, yeah. As a child, did good. you just used to eat everything? Just ate. Didn't really worry about anything. And then... Life was fun then, wasn't it? Now, so what I've got here is this crumb. You can see it just sort of looks quite powdery. And then here's where the magic happens. You just add a little glug of oil, and this is where I've got to be careful, because sometimes I a add glug, too much. A glug, not a gloop. A glug, <laughs> yeah, call it whatever you like. And you mix it again, just briefly, and it starts, no, need a bit more. You can always add more, you can't take it out. That was one thing my mum taught me. Actually, she taught me a lot. And what we get is this cool little, oh yeah, it will come out. This cool little crumb that is kind of, it's got almost like this um, wet, oh look, chefs like to, oh, I've made it too wet, hang on, hang on. So that didn't take long, so what have no. you got in there again, you've got? I've just got chocolate, cocoa, and I'm not even going to be able to get the blade back in, so mm. here, look. <laughs> Add a bit more cocoa just to dry it out a bit. But yeah. what you've got is this crumb, can you see it? No. You've got this sort of soily crumb that just tastes of chocolate. I don't like it when they call it soil because who wants to eat soil? Four-year-old boys. Chocolate crumb. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But you've got this chocolate crumb that just adds, again, that soft crunch of texture. Um, and you can play around with that too. If you blend it a bit less, you get a chunkier crumb. If you blend it a bit more, you get a smoother sort of crumb. And we've got almost all our elements ready to go. Because your nice first cookbook was a all sweet desserts. desserts. Yes, it was all desserts because I could. You love desserts. Because I love dessert. And then so, from there after MasterChef, you also used to sell I did. at the local so, Satter stall at the Orange Market. Yeah, so I began a bit of a little cake making business because I wanted an excuse to be able to keep cooking sweet all the time, even when I finished the cookbook. Uh, so I started make a little business where I made cakes and things for cafes, and then I'd sell them at the markets, because I love being involved in my local community. So I'd go along to the markets and I would, um, I would sell them also by private orders. People just ring up, can I yep. have a cake? And so I was doing that for a couple of years. 
Um, but immediately after MasterChef, it was really a lot of just travel and craziness. Um, and then I've pulled back on that travel so that I could do more of the cakes. Mm. Uh, but of late, I've actually, at the end of last year, actually wrapped up that cakes business because in our broader family, we just had some big health issues going on and some just big life things happening, not so much in our little nucleus family, but in our broader family. And I just needed to make the decision that what, what did I want life to be? And, and I think, look, at the end of the day, again, being a Christian shaped what that would be like. Um, I, needed, I needed to feel that what I was doing was worthwhile. And I felt that a lot of the other things, like making cake, it's lovely. But at the end of the day, people eat cake, makes them fat, and there's no real greater purpose. So I stopped doing that so that I was available more to care for my immediate family, who've been incredibly patient as I've travelled and done all sorts of crazy things. How many years ago was your MasterChef success? So it was 2011. 11. So five years ago. And since then, it's been pretty full on. It's been on. pretty full on. Um, yeah, it was very full on for 2012 and 13. In 2014, I pulled back and that's when I started doing the business. Um, and I did the business for 2014, 2015. And at the end of last year, I pulled that back. And I'm actually now teaching um, at my local school. So I've gone back to teaching because the hours just fit with my kids. Um, and there's opportunity there to get kids there into the garden and hopefully down the track cooking as well. Because I just, I, I love to be able to teach kids about where their food comes from, how to prepare it simply, how to look after themselves as they grow. Mm. Um, and I also have an opportunity in the school where I'm at as well to teach them religious education. So I get, okay. I get both loves back into my work, so I'm, I'm loving it. All right, so with the uh, praline, after about 15, 20 minutes, oh, you could have chocolate praline, um, you, get, you get a nice solid mass, and then you just need a biggish knife, and all it is is just chop it up. Now, you've got options here as well. I could have chopped up those nuts beforehand and done it more as a, a pureed sort of thing, and then you can make sheets and make shards and all sorts of things. But like I said before, I just go, these days I just like to go for simple and tasty. I'm looking for taste, flavour and, and texture. But I don't want these nuts to be too big, otherwise, you know, you bite down on them and you get a bit of a shock. So we're just going to chop them until they sort of crumble, and we'll just do enough. Here, we don't need to do it all. Again, that can then, when it's cooled down completely, can just go in an airtight container in your uh, pantry, and that's a really yummy topping mm. on ice cream. Mm. Mm. Or yes. just eat it. So is this chocolate yes. crumb. That chocolate crumb's really good, just sprinkled on ice cream. And the boozy oranges are actually great at Christmas time with a, with a Christmas pudding or anything like do that. Do your kids ever fight over who gets to eat? And lick the spoon. Oh, and... yeah, all the time. Or well, you know what we've discovered recently, and I was stupid. We bought some non homogenised milk, mm. and you get the cream at the top. Mm. And I told the kids, oh, look at this, there's cream at the top. Now I don't get a look in. Oh. I don't get it. <laughs> Unless I sneak it in before they come, and then they say, Mum, you had all the cream. Sorry. It's a bit like when, as a kid, I used to love having that froth on the cappuccino. Yes, yeah. yeah, they do, they love it. Um, so what I'm going to do is steal these plates and we're going to serve up. Now, our mascarpone is here. Now, you could do it in a bowl, you could do it however you like. These plates are quite big, but that will be all right. So I like to do mascarpone on the bottom. And then if you want to, you can be really fancy and do your smear. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Personally, I'd rather just a blob, but anyway. And then what we're going to do, it's not too hot, so it's okay, is just lay our oranges. One of the things with plating is supposedly odd numbers uh, look better to the eye. Florists will tell you that. And then I will grab some of my chocolate crumble and just sprinkle it over. You know, you can do this in a glass. You can sort of layer it up in a glass as well, orange and chocolate and cream. And then and more chocolate, because, you know, it's always good to have more chocolate. Can you ever chocolate. have too much chocolate? I have too much chocolate, no. ever. And then a little bit of the beautiful praline. And if I had a piping bag, I'd even then get extra little dollops. Although I said I'm not into piping bags, and I do actually quite like my piping bag occasionally. 
you know, I could actually pipe well, piping a piping bag, one, that's the thing that you, know, you put it all in and then squeeze you know. it. Yep. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get a dollop. And you're going to be all master anyway, chef -y. Yeah, no, nah, let's not be master chef. Let's just eat it and enjoy it. Yes. All right. Wonderful. So, Yum. there's one. Now, there's Craig. Yeah, Craig did mention that he... Did you want some? He said earlier, oh, gosh, I hope I can try loves, some of that. He, he loves... How about you have that one and I'll make myself another one. Hi, Craig. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> How good's this? <laughs> I've... No, I can't say that because my wife's here. I was going to say, I've never <laughs> quite had something <laughs> like this. <laughs> but it is amazing. So who cooks at your home? My wife. <laughs> she she cooks, do you ever cook? She cooks beautifully. Uh, we don't tend to have a lot of desserts. Uh, um, and I came from a house where my mother always did desserts. Aww. So, So is that... No. So I get to the end of the meal and I always go... Are we having dessert tonight? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it's fair enough. My, kid, enough. my kids always ask, how come we don't have dessert every night? Like, you know, you're, you're the dessert person. How can we only have dessert when friends come <laughs> over? Because I don't want you to be the size of a bus. <laughs> What's your favourite food? My favourite food? Savoury or sweet? Sweet. Sweet. Oh, it's clichéd. It's, it has to be chocolate. I'm going to sit there and mm. eat it. Um, I'm quite known for, you know, we don't do dessert every night, but I should say the kids don't do dessert every night. How bad is that? <laughs> they all go to bed and Luke and I tuck in and often it is ice cream with a bit of leftover chocolate crumble or hazelnut praline or a bit of chocolate sauce or can anything we, like that. Get, can go we go for it. Yes. <laughs> like... Everyone else, like, we have to be, we have to be polite. Think, yeah, Wait till everybody's sitting down at the table right. and got their food. So, Craig, you're the minister amongst the group here. How does food fit into the and this Bible? This is heaven. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's amazing. I'm not and a big other... chocolate fan, but the combination... Not a cho I don't understand people yeah. that are not a chocolate fan. What language is that? I don't know. Not a chocolate fan. <laughs> I am a big toffee fan. Yeah, yeah. right. Sorry, you know what was the about... question? <laughs> You're the, you're the minister here. How does food sort of fit into the Bible and relationships and who we are? Um, I think I had a bit of a view like Kate when I was growing up. I thought that um, it was all about doing things, getting things done, and ticking the right boxes. But I think the, probably the, the most... Um, the most profound picture I think I've come across in the Bible, being a minister who has to preach regularly, mm. is the picture of the banquet. So when, if you look through the Bible from the beginning through to the end, there's this constant picture of God wanting to invite you to the table mm. to have a meal. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's, look at us, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a great picture of uh, how God wants to have a relationship with you um, as opposed to thinking it's all about, you know, rule keeping and doing this and ticking that off and making sure you're clean and all that sort mm. of stuff. So you know, one thing stuff. I've noticed too, the Bible has so many pictures of food. So um, there's, Jesus says at one point, he is the bread of life. Like he, he's, you know, we need food every day and we need Jesus in our life. And, and then there's this other beautiful picture in... Um, in another part of the Bible where it talks about your soul being satisfied as with the richest of foods. That one speaks to me because I go, oh, I know that feeling. Mm -hmm. I know when I've had a really good meal and I sit back and I think, oh, that was good. But the problem is, is that the next day I'm hungry again. Oh. But with God, I think there's this picture of he satisfies you as with the richest of foods, but that goes on and on and on forever. You don't, you don't ever lose it. You don't need topping up. It just when you stay in relationship with God, you've got that satisfaction. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I, I think it's the company too that often makes the food mm. so wonderful. Um, this is beautiful. But to do, to do it with you and Lachlan, sit up here and enjoy a dessert, is just amazing. I think that aspect for me we'll comes out. We'll pay later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly. Um, and that, that part of it, is quite a surprise for me in the Bible too, mm. is that the, the whole idea of the company yeah. 
uh, that, that God wants to have company with you yeah. and invite you to his table with the best food and the best yeah. wine and that it won't run out and we won't get fat. Yeah. You know, oh, that's yeah. Wow. Yeah. How good All is right. that? Fantastic. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the way it's described, it's describing the Bible as a banquet, as a feast. And you just think, yes, I want to be there. Well, I do. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. It's great. It's fantastic. That, can I? Who, who, whose favourite meal is dessert? Whose favourite meal is the main course? <laughs> yeah, it's about 50-50. Now, what about for you, Lachlan? Yeah. Why, you know, what are your thoughts on God? <laughs> <laughs> you can see I'm not a good interviewer, can not you? <laughs> I want to talk. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, look. Because um, it is pretty funny for a mayor to be up on stage chatting to me about my faith. So what, can hasn't I turn it back before? on you? No, never. Do you know your mayor? I do know my mayor. <laughs> do you know when I got home from MasterChef, they wanted to throw me a ticker tape parade? Really? <laughs> Did you get the key to the city? I got the key to the city. Yeah. I got, I, we, instead, we had a civic reception. I love right. living and in a little country town. Would have been town. in the town hall. Yeah. Oh no, full ceremony. Everyone came along. How sweet is Did that? Did you have to cook the food? No. <laughs> I should have, shouldn't I? That was a bit silly, weren't they? <laughs> no, but look, you know. uh, look, my faith is incredibly important to me, especially in, um, in my role as mayor. Um, I mean, so I, I sit uh, with the other elected members chairing the meeting, and we have a number of uh, quite important and sometimes very difficult issues that we need to discuss through. I must admit I'm very blessed to have a great group of councillors, but the small p political element does creep into it at times and there are some times that you can see someone talking from the point of view of wanting to, I guess, build them, themselves up a little bit or you can see sometimes there's a bit of a misrepresentation or a misunderstanding of the issue itself. Well, uh, a number of the councillors um, before the council meeting will pray and will always ask God to be with us in the council meetings. And I think that's important because it doesn't matter what uh, I want or what one of the councillors might want or what any one individual wants, but it's what God mm. wants and is best. And I really feel that when we bring... God and Jesus into that decision-making process in that way, I actually have a great confidence that the decisions that we make are leading the community in the right direction. Mm. So from that point of view, I'd, for the community, it's, it's, yeah. it's incredibly important for me. I think it's interesting, isn't it, how your faith actually impacts every part of your life. You can't separate it. I'm not somebody who goes, right, well, I'm just a Christian on a Sunday because I've got to go to church and that's it. But it actually impacts every decision that we make and every aspect of life. And for me, that's a real joy because there's a steadfastness. I know that God doesn't change. Everything else in my life changes. And boy, don't I know that after MasterChef. And during very <laughs> stressful times, I find a, a huge amount of security knowing that yeah. they're at my side. You know, I'm saying a prayer. I know that God and Jesus is... With always there. me, yeah. And you get a different times. perspective on life. Like I think, um, you know, in MasterChef, they're always wanting you to, oh, this is the most important decision you will ever make. No, it's not. It's just television. You go, shush. <laughs> can you can you just play along? You know, I think it just it brings a different perspective to things. I always, I wasn't always like that. In so far as, and Craig, your daughter, uh, she was head of Concordia College. Just be careful. She's here. <laughs> <laughs> but she was she was the head of Concordia College, and it was either the commencement or the end of year service. And we were uh, you as the father and myself as the mayor were up in the principal's office, not being told off, but <laughs> celebrating the start or the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And we were talking, and you asked me if I'd ever read the Bible. And at that stage, I'd had a number of goes where I'd plonk the Bible down, open the front cover, start at Genesis. <laughs> yeah, I did that a few times. You know. I'm going to get through. I'm going, I'm going to get, get through. through. And I told you too. that and you said, well, how about we just sort of sit down and read Luke? Mm. And we did that over a period of, oh, it would have been a couple of months, catch up for a coffee. And that was a really important 
journey for me, and I thank you for being able to go down that with me, and we did it over coffee and breakfast often. And I think that's a really important point to make because the Bible is not just a book that you open up and, and read from cover to cover. It, it's a complicated um, document that's been put together over thousands of years, and there's so many different aspects to it that it really helps to sit down and read it with somebody who understands that context, mm. would you say? It, it, is, it is hard. I know, but the thing is, the good thing for me with you reading it with me is that you got me to see it through fresh eyes as well. Because when you've been a minister and you've read a Bible for years and years and years and you've studied it, um, you actually see it in a certain way and then all of a sudden you see how somebody else is viewing it. And um, you, you won't remember this, but you said to me after you read a bit of the Bible, you said, uh, I said, have you got any questions? And you said, um, yeah, how do you handle temptation? And I thought, <laughs> I was ready for anything about, you know, whether God's there and what are angels and all that. So I wasn't ready for what do I get tempted with <laughs> in life. So um, I, think, I think it took me a little while to sort of, uh, you know, sort of see how you saw it. And uh, that was helpful for me, mm. really helpful. Mm. Well, um, I'd like to lick my plate, but I don't think that's polite. <laughs> <laughs> Just move the microphone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Kate and Lockham, we really appreciate it. It wouldn't have worked without you tonight. Thanks. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thank you for coming and see you at our next event. Thanks. <laughs>